Good morning. Today we're continue, gonna, we're going to continue in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and we'll be picking up at verse 31. But let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this time. We can come together to study your word. We ask that your word may produce fruit in our hearts and our minds. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we actually start with that verse, just to kind of bring in the, back the context, in verses 16 to 30, we read Jesus giving his testimony about himself. He is the Son of God, and he's equal to the Father. He does the work of the Father on earth. He knows what the Father knows. His power to resurrect and give life is equal to the Father's. He judges with the Father's authority. His honor and glory are equal to the Father's. And like his Father, he gives eternal life to those that he desires. And like the Father, he's self-existent. He is life. He received his life from no other source. In fact, he's the source of life. So after testifying about himself, he states in verse 31, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. The word alone is not in the original Greek. It's put here by the translators. The Greek actually says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. And yet, later on in uh, chapter 8, verse 14, he's going to say that his testimony is true. Let's start with John 8, verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. So in verse 13, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And this comes from the law. Deuteronomy 19.15 says, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. But then Jesus answers him and claims that his testimony is true because he knows it is true. He knows who he is, and he has been with the Father, and he knows more than they do. Let's take a look. In, continuing in verse 15, You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgments are true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in the law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So he, when he's testifying about, him, about himself, he has a built-in witness. In chapter 5 of John's Gospel, Jesus testified that he is God. None of that counts as truth if there are no other witnesses. This doesn't mean it's not true, but legally what is true cannot be distinguished from what is false without more than one witness. So it cannot be counted as true. In Jewish, Greek, and Roman law, the testimony of a witness is not received in his own case. There needs to be other witnesses. So his father is a witness and testifies about Jesus and testifies that what he says is true. So there is a testimony of two persons. The question is, don't they trust the Father's testimony? Going back to John chapter 5, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is true. Is not true. There is another who testifies of me. And I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. And here he's referring to his father. 
Jesus has said that the Son can do nothing independently of the Father. Uh, beginning with, you know, going all the way back to ni uh, verse 19 and continuing through his testimony about himself. That's what he said every time. The truthfulness of his claims about himself did not rest on his own testimony exclusively. The Father testifies of him because the words he spoke about himself came directly from the Father. Therefore, Jesus witnessed for his testimony about himself must reflect the Father's witness about him. The words of Jesus were the words of the Father. The Father witnessed to the deity of Jesus. Remember from last week, Jesus did not speak merely of his own accord. Jesus' knowledge came from unity with the Father. So there are two witnesses here. Father is not the only witness. Jesus knew, Jesus knows the Jews don't believe him and they don't recognize or understand the witness of his father behind them. So he reminds them of another witness. In verse 33, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you might be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining and you are willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So John the Baptist, he was the first testimony to corroborate Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. The Jews of Jesus' day deemed John as a valid prophet. They themselves had interrogated him perfectly, uh, personally. Jesus reminded the Jews that they had once accepted the Baptist's testimony. Their very own research bore testimony to Jesus as the Messiah. In John 1, verses 23 to 35, it records John the Baptist's witness to Christ. Where it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man, <clears throat> who has higher rank than I, for he existed before me. John testified, saying, <clears throat> I have seen the Spirit descending on a dove, as a dove out of the heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So John already testified. The phrase, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, refers to Isaiah 53, verses 7 to, 13, 7 to 12, where the Messiah is described as, He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. And in verse 30, he testifies that Jesus is the pre-existent one. Verse 34, he testifies that he is the Son of God. <clears throat> so back to our passage in verse 34, Jesus is, begins, he just kind of inserts a side note here. Because Jesus did not need John's testimony. Uh, he didn't need to accept human testimony of any kind in order to establish his identity in his own mind. The only witness he needed was the Father's witness. He simply mentioned John the Baptist's witness in order to establish his identity in his hearer's mind so they might believe on him and obtain salvation. John was not the true light, though. He was the lamp that bore witness to the true light. John's ministry had caused considerable messianic excitement. Unfortunately, most of John's hearers only chose to follow his teachings temporarily. They rejoiced in his testimony about the true light, but they, their rejoicing didn't last very long. In verse 36, But the testimony which I get have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, they testify about me that the Father has sent me. So the works that Jesus does, they testify that Jesus is the Son of God. 
Jesus did not perform signs and miracles. John did not perform any signs or miracles, but Jesus does. These works are greater witness than John's claims. These works included his miracles. As we can remember, signs and miracles and wonders are used by God to validate the one that he sent as being from him. They also validate his words and his teaching. His works also were the works of the Father, as we saw back in verses 19 to 30. Once we understand the Father-Son relationship, we can see that everything that Jesus says and does is precisely what the Father said and did. After mentioning the witness and testimony of his own works, he continues with the witness of his Father. Verse 37 and 38. <clears throat> and the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You had neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. <clears throat> you did not have his voice, his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who has sent you, who has, whom he sent. Jesus continues with the witness of his Father. How the Father is given testimony is, is really not explained here. But Jesus tells his accusers, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. It seems that Jesus might be referring in part to the time of his baptism when John and the Baptist and uh, perhaps others may have seen the Spirit of God present and abiding on Jesus in the form of a dove. They heard the voice of God identifying Jesus as his son in whom he took great delight. Here the Father is bearing witness to him as the Son, the Messiah. These Jews may not have seen this, um, but beyond this, the, the Father also bears witness through the Son. That's what Jesus has been talking about. When Jesus is talking, it's the Father talking, but they don't hear his voice or they don't see his form. Um, but Jesus is God manifested in human flesh. Jesus is the voice, the word of God. In John 8:18, 8, it says, I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. If we look forward to later on, Hebrews 1, verse 1, uh, the writer says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through him whom all, also he made the world. So the Father speaks through his Son. God is bearing witness through his Son. And here's the irony, the Jewish authorities will not accept Jesus as the Son of God. They simply will not heed his testimony. Yet, he is the voice of God the visible manifestation of God to men. They have never seen or heard God in person. And God is now standing right before them, accusing, being accused by them. They are accusing the very one they claim to worship and serve. Second reason why they reject Jesus was that they did not have God's word abiding in them. They reject Jesus because they don't believe the Father who sent him. Remember in verse 23, Jesus said, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And later John's going to write in one of his letters, 1 John 2, 23, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. They may have read God's word in the scriptures, may even be able to quote it. But not believing Jesus whom God sent to them is the same as not believing the Father who sent him. If God's word had been abiding in them, they would have recognized their Messiah and believed in Jesus. In these verses, 27 to 38, Jesus turns to them and begins rebuking them. And we will see that this continues uh, from here. And speaking of scriptures, we come to the next testimony or witness, which is of the scriptures themselves. Jesus has testified of John's witness and the Father's witness, and now he will testify of the witness of their scriptures. 
in verse 39 to 42. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. The scriptures testify about Jesus being the Son of God. The Jewish scribes meticulously studied the Old Testament. This is not a command to study scripture, but a statement about the fact that the Jews were diligent to study the Old Testament. Jewish leaders sought to understood, understand the word of God, but they did not know the God of the word. They did not see Jesus as Messiah in the Bible. They believed that searching the scriptures diligently, they would find the way to eternal life. But the scriptures pointed to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, as their giver of eternal life. So how could these men possess the scriptures and study them and yet miss the main point of their teaching. Jesus tells them that they do not have the word abiding in them. They are in the word, but the word is not in them. The scriptures testify of Jesus, but they are unwilling to come to him for eternal life. They are blind to the central message of the very scriptures they possess and regard so highly. Why are they so unwilling to come to Jesus for salvation? It's because they seek glory and praise from men, rather from God. Jesus does not seek the praise of men. He seeks only to please the Father, <clears throat> because he loves the Father. The leaders of Jesus' day did not love God, although they claimed to love him. True love for God would motivate people to find the Messiah in the Bible. However, Jesus Remarks rebuked them because they did not study the word with pure hearts. They loved themselves rather than God. All their knowledge of the Bible did not lead them to the truth. They had access to the truth, but pride kept them from recognizing it. They did not recognize the deity of Christ. And he continues his rebuke in verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? The two things are evidence in their lack of love for God. They rejected Christ, the Father's representative. One who comes in, in the name of Another is like an ambassador, and by rejecting Jesus, they rejected the Father's ambassador who had come in his name, and therefore they have rejected the Father. If they had known and loved the Father, they would have recognized Jesus' similarity to the Father. Secondly, they rejected the true Messiah, but religious leaders would follow false messiahs, especially another messiah coming in his own name. Rejection of what is true always makes one susceptible to counterfeits. An additional failure was their desire for acceptance and approval from sinful men. They seek applause for men. The Jews sought the approval of people rather than God. They feared the judgment of the crowd and their reproach, seeking Approval for men is the same as receiving glory from men. And this is what is important to them, approval and glory from each other. True faith was impossible because they were seeking the wrong, wrong object. They sought man and not God. They seek glory from man. They don't seek the glory from God. And Jesus now reveals the last witness, the one who testifies about Jesus also is Moses. <clears throat> Verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? The Jewish authorities, they reject Jesus. 
They not only rejected his testimony concerning himself, they set aside the testimony of John the Baptist and the testimony of our Lord's works, the testimony of the Father and the testimony of the scriptures. And because of this, they are the ones who will be accursed. Those who are accusing Jesus will be accursed, but not by Jesus. Their accusation will come from Moses, the one they revere, whose law they impose upon themselves and others as they interpret it. Their devotion to Moses is seen in the dialogue between the Jews and the blind man to whom Jesus came, whom Jesus gives sight. And this is recorded in John 9, we'll get there, in 28 and 29 where it says they heaped insults on him, saying, you are his disciple, or we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. We do not know where this man comes from. So he's, they are totally devoted to Moses. This Moses, so revered by the Jews, he's going to be their accuser because he too testified of Jesus. They did not believe Moses. Neither will they believe Jesus. Jesus does not specify any particular passage in which Moses wrote of the Messiah, but we know that there are many. For example, Jesus is the prophet of whom Moses spoke in Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19, where it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you ask of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me see his great fire. Let me not see his great fire any more, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among the countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So Moses is a witness for Jesus. The scriptures give them the writings of Moses, and they have heard Jesus' words. So rejection of Christ is a rejection of Moses. Israel, who rejected truth taught by Moses, whom they respected, would not respond to truth set forth by Jesus, whom they despised. They thought that God would accept them by their keeping of the law. If people do not understand and believe scriptures, a document that they trust, how can they ever believe the truth? Just as they look at Moses and they revere Moses and they just eat up everything that Moses says, so they trust everything Moses says, but yet they reject it. Today, we have the witness of Scripture. The testimony of Christ is in Scripture. The testimony of the Father is found in Scripture. We see the testimony of John the Baptist in Scripture. We see the testimony of the works that Jesus did in Scripture. We also today, we have the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, John's going to say in chapter 15, verse 26, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness of me. The most important question in anyone's life is, Who is Jesus? And the answer is right in front of us, found in God's Word. It's our job to take that answer and, and, and give that to other people who have not, been, have not been saved. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for John's message and for using him to show the world that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we can have eternal life. Lord, teach us who you are, not only concerning salvation, but in everything else, too. Knowing you is knowing the Father. Knowing you is wisdom and strength and joy. Knowing you is the life that we are to walk. 
We thank you for your patience and your grace and your love and the power and authority of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.